it's, it's great to be here after a few years of uh, not being present as a speaker. It's a great privilege and also great pressure. Um, for a few reasons, it's the second day of the conference, so probably you already packed uh, before going home. Um, and of course, it's after lunch, so uh, you may become sleepy. So I'll try to entertain you and activate you. So please be aware that uh, some even physical or vocal activity may be needed. Okay, the topic of my, my speech today is a little bit of clickbait, uh, so you could uh, come and, and roast me later about what is the cognitive load. Um, but I want to give, uh, like, in the American movies, there's always this viewer discretion advised. Why? Because following slides and presentation include, no one can feel safe because I'm gonna challenge the mechanistic approach to managing coupling systems. If you still want to stay with us in this room, that's perfectly fine. I'm going to roast a little bit less on the things which are wishful thinking approach, absolutely disregarding human nature, natural evolution, and realistic market conditions. Okay? You've been warned, so please stay. Uh, all the good things, you know, sugar, spice, and everything nice that I'm going to include today is mostly team topologies and Kanban method and the likes. Okay, so in the topic of our presentation today, we have this cognitive load. Who of you have heard the term? Okay, who of you have some definition of under or understanding of what is cognitive load? Okay, if we would have like now 10 minutes break, I could go distribute post-its to you and ask you to write the definition and let's just say 30 people raise their hands. How many definitions of cognitive load we would have? Yeah, a lot, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, my, my goal today is absolutely not to uh, prove that any one uh, definition of cognitive load is the right one for individuals or teams. Uh, if you go into fields of psychology or education, you will find that some people call it working memory, etc. What I'm gonna um, try to uh, take you through is a kind of uh, journey so we could identify if uh, this, um, even vague definition of uh, cognitive load is uh, uh, yeah, somehow uh, possible to sense in, in our organizations. So what is this cognitive load anyway? Let's learn together. So I work as a consultant and coach and very often if I work with some organization or the organization um, ask me to, to maybe consider working with them, I speak to the bosses. Who is the boss in here? Well. The boss could be someone really high, like engineering department, manager, maybe the owner of the company. And very often we ask these people um, questions. What kind of teams you have in your organization? What kind of answer do we expect? Oh, that's great you're asking, because we are all agile teams. They are all cross-functional, teal, self-managing, gluten-fry, and what's best, they have their dailies at this exactly the same time of the day. Okay, um, very often people in this moment also refer to org charts. Who of you have seen the org chart of your organization? Okay. Yeah, what does it show? Well, <laughs> yeah, a, a pyramid, a diagram, uh, something that very often has nothing in, in, in common with how people communicate and what is the intensity of communication or flow of information between these boxes. Uh, because this is the org chart, this is the line management uh, chart, uh, this is uh, something that we had to create for legal reasons or labor law reasons or whatever else. So let's not be judgmental. Of course, someone could say, that was apparently Michael Scott of our company, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah? Okay, uh, let's not be judgmental because if someone says that they have teams in the organization, let's look into one of the teams and ask them, a really important question, and this is the moment when I want us to do it all together. So please repeat with me, just like this would be the, I don't know, wedding or something. Do you feel you're effective and able to respond in timely fashion? Definitely British. To the work now on your own? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. 
So this is a quotation from Team Topology's book. Definitely, I bet this chapter was written by Matthew because he's British, like the timely fashion, okay? Uh, but we know what it means, yeah? Not every time of delivery, not every lead time is acceptable for our business, for uh, our customers. And if the answer to this question is no, then probably we have something uh, maybe dangerous, maybe uh, something we would like to resolve regarding the mm, cognitive load. So let's ask the team, what do they say? Uh, no. Okay. What are the scenarios, and of course we have multiple scenarios that we could consider, I'm going to highlight two of them, um, that could actually guide us to yeah, a situation like this, or lead us to a situation like this. So in some of the companies we hear that Yes, we would like to deliver something, but we are not able to because we have so many interwined uh, dependencies in the organization, internal, external. They close us in one room once in three months or five sprints. They give us a lot of string and, and you know, try to predict yeah, the, the dependencies. Uh, but usually in the middle of the period, we are asked to do something that was completely not planned and yeah, lots of waste. There's another scenario, um, which is more about cognitive load, because you could say, well, disregard all those um, uh, dependencies that you have. Uh, what we want you to do is pretty much not be just experts in blue, but also in red and yellow and purple and uh, pink and, and gray and brown. Yeah? Is it possible? Does it have any limits? I mean, who of you are Agile coaches or Scrum Masters? Okay. Those of you who raise the hands, who of you write the code? Okay. Who of you take care in, I don't know, uh, marketing campaigns writing? Oh, okay, if you want and fewer, you see, because what we are going to talk about is the whole cognitive load to deliver the product all together. And that's very often hiring right people, uh, writing, uh, you know, Thanks to Piotr's speech, we know that we, we can ask AI to generate some content. But we are talking about far more than just writing the code or, or, or delivering um, a functional uh, feature. And this leads to something what I call domains overflow. That's not the part of team topologies. That's a term I made yesterday preparing the slides. So don't take it for granted. So what now? We slowly understand that the cognitive load is a situation in which individuals and teams feel like they are overwhelmed with number of domains, expertise that they, that they need to have. And of course, we could say, find the right people, uh, but okay, who of us has such teams? Who of us don't want to be the masters, remember Daniel Pink, uh, of, of something? And, and of course, there's nothing wrong about T-shape, comp shape, whatever, but it all has limits. Okay. What is worse is that we have this, and this is a quotation from Craig Larman, false dichotomy. So we find ourselves in the middle of this clash. We create dependencies, and that's good because managing dependencies creates new job positions in our company. <laughs> you may, let's just say, refer to one scaling framework or, or not, yeah? On the other hand, we have, well, we create ultimate adaptability and we basically uh, completely disregard or ignore human nature, our limitations, uh, natural evolution, that you know, the fact that we are here is a result of specification of our cells into tissues and organs. Is there anything in between? So there is this guy, um, I think yesterday we, were, we had reference in the keynote to um, Edward W. Deming, Today I'm going to refer to, to another big uh, brain, big mind of, of management, who said, organizational structure is a tool of executive, a means to an end achieving long and short-term goals of organization. Anyone knows who, who is the author of this quote? Peter Drucker, very, very well. The fact is that it's nothing new because probably I'm one of the oldest people in this room, and still, Drucker said it before we all, including myself, were born. Yeah? So that's not a, a new thing. That's not a, that's not a problem that ChatGPT generated for us. Yeah? It's with us for decades. So 
okay, um, what do we do with it? And one thing I want you to, to think of is to identify what kind of problems we have and have uh, a decision and uh, build probably some kind of alliance to do something with it uh, in, in your organizations. Well, I say start with what you do now. Yeah, I know he was going to talk Kanbanish. If, if you say start with what you do now, any people recall what, what is it? In Kanban vocabulary? Yeah. Okay, I need to review some of the certificates I issued. <laughs> um, it's the first principle, yeah? We want to know where we are. And where we are is something that we can learn if we map our existing teams to common observed types of the teams. What are these type of the teams? You probably had a short glance into, gl glance, glimpse into it yesterday during um, Thomas Wilk's presentation. If it's repetition, bear with me. Uh, maybe you will learn something more. So basically, uh, we say, well, for decades we are talking about teams which are cross-functional and uh, do the awesome job of getting a customer need and translating it into ideally verified, validated uh, value. Yeah? Do, you, do you feel this type of teams is good? Yeah. Um, these teams should probably be long-lived. These teams should be as cross-functional as possible. Um, and uh, it's good to have such teams. Team topologies doesn't say that you shouldn't have such teams. But we also have other type of teams. The other type of team is enabling team. Enabling team is something that should be close to our hearts or scrum masters, agile coaches, change agents, consultants, organizational designers, whoever. Um, why? Because, as the name suggests, the enabling teams are the teams that should enable other teams or individuals to do X or can do Y or something like this. What this X or Y could be? Well, it could be AI. <laughs> There's no good presentation these days without mentioning AI. This could be you ship it and you run it. Yeah? So some people say maybe DevOps stuff. Uh, in the end, uh, See, because there's a timer which is like, uh, um, overlaying the slides. This could be the way of working. Do it Scrum, do it the Kanban way, do it the double diamond way, whatever. Um, that's why good thing is that we now very often see that all these Agile coaches team are basically called ways of working enabling teams. Yeah, which is something, uh, something more transparent even in the name of it. So we have enabling teams. Is that all? Ah, okay, now it's the hot moment. Why? Because during the investigation of what, times, uh, what type of teams we have, we may, found s we may find something that is called complicated subsystem team. And for those of you who... Um, we're in organizations uh, where we have component teams. This is like burn. Yeah, this is the worst possible thing. So these guys, one guy from Spain and one guy from uh, from, Bra from United Kingdom, now basically codify that it's good to have team of analysts and team of front end and team. No, that's not what it means. But very often in our organization we have such type of teams and we don't see what kind of well. Um, obstacle on the way to the flow it is. So, again, start with what you do now. First important fact is that it doesn't need to be a component team. It could be a team that we don't prefer, but for some market, legal, regulations reasons, you could have it, like a team of lawyers. Yeah? Maybe we cannot, uh, let's just say, afford to have lawyer in every team. Uh, maybe that's going to change become, because teams, uh, because uh, lawyers will be basically, um, you know, swapped to legal chat GPTs. We don't know. Yeah, this is very often consequence of the past. So what the authors have in mind here is the Conway's law. Who knows what Conway's law says? 
Okay, some, some hands up, okay. So we very often see it or feel it when we are using some application that this definitely was not built by stream-aligned team or cross-functional team, but probably it's a kind of Frankenstein sued together from work of separate front-end and back-end and whatever people, yeah? So, okay, just uh, what is important, manage these type of teams and evolve beyond them. Is that all? Well, very briefly, we very often see something that we call platform groupings. There is an asterisk here because the authors initially called it platforms. And you know what happened? Every team decided to be a platform team, which wasn't anything good. So they explicitly say platforms should be very, very, very few of them. It's a very rare case. And uh, I don't think you see it well, but inside this platform grouping, you have its internal structure, right? So probably there's like a fractal repeating structure of other type of teams who provide the platform, yeah? I think it's easy to understand that if you launch the mobile apps, you don't know what's behind the, I don't know, app store, yeah? You imagine that there's probably more than one team behind it, uh, but for you, it's, it's not as important. Okay, so we have all these Lego bricks, we have all these type of teams, and what's next? Well, first of all, it doesn't mean that we need to stay with the type and number of the teams that we have. Because remember that the organizational structure is a tool and should evolve, right? So if it doesn't need to stay the way it is, um, where do these findings actually lead us? So this is a real case. In one of the companies that I worked with, we had like 14 or 15 teams all together working on one product, multiple locations, different cultures, etc. And in one short exercise, we actually explain these type of teams to, um, to team members and ask them, please identify yourself according to this typology. What was interesting finding is like lots of teams identified themselves as complicated subsystems. None of them identified themselves as enabling team. We identified few stream aligned teams who explicitly said, this is really fake because we are not able to deliver anything without the other teams. Um, so yesterday, my son had his birthday and I, uh, we, we bought him the Lego set. You know, today is the last episode of Ahsoka Tano uh, series first season, so I know I'm gonna try to speed up now so you could watch it. Uh, I, I bought him the Lego model of Ahsoka's uh, starship. Uh, what you believe is probably inside, uh, there are multiple type of Lego bricks. And this is how big organizations are usually made of. So you have a problem if you want to build a car or a spaceship, but all you have is the same type of square, square red Lego bricks and platforms, so the Lego plates. How to build it? Hmm? So this is not codifying, this is not justifying the type of the teams that we have, but it can show us this kind of analysis, diagnosis, that we probably have some kind of imbalance in force of the type of teams that we have, okay? No wheels, no wheels. So how can we build, build, a, build a car, okay? So now the key message of it is like, we will need the right number of the right type of teams to build something valuable. And you know what's worse? It will change over time. So we will now need different number and different type of teams than six months from now and a year from now. Problem is that when I look at many roadmaps for products, I don't see any layer talking about what type of teams we will have. We have only focus on features, releases, deadlines. Okay. Again, I'm going to talk Kanbanish. We very often say that in Kanban maturity model, we see organizations which are team focused, where teams are actually so cohesive, so strong, uh, that the flow of work between the teams is basically not really good because it's us versus them. It's business versus IT. It's those, you know, morons in marketing versus us. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah? This is like a really negative language and uh, it, doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be even so strong, um, but we see that the work and value doesn't flow for organizations like this. Okay. I said, how to balance being agile? So being able 
to be effective and respond in a timely fashion, yada, 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 and at the same time, not make our heads and our teams exploding. We definitely say we want to limit the cognitive load of individuals and teams. This is something like maybe limiting work in progress, so how many contexts you need to switch between. We want to build teams which are, are either stable or they exist in a high trust culture. Who of you have uh, flown with an airplane in like the last several months? Okay, so you had a crew on board. Are they actually a stable team? No, they change every time. They don't work in, in fixed configurations. Yeah? They change pilot and co-pilot and, and all the you know, uh, people on the board working and serving, I don't know, food or helping you with something. They change, but they, they work in a high trust culture. They are trained to work with different people. We want to align these teams, um, I would say, along one or more, but not too many areas on ongoing basis. What does it mean? It means that your team or your two teams may focus now on something, but it doesn't mean that they will be focused on, on, on it completely forever. Yeah? It may change, it will change in the future. We want to limit the number and size of the subsystems, but of course it could be dangerous because we could lead only to these you know, so micro subsystems that like no value is flowing. And we want to provide underlining platforms, but, when, uh, as, but as I said, probably not too many of them. Okay, so we identify and design the right interactions because what uh, is the fun part now is like what is happening between these teams. And there's this saying that agility is not a team sport, it is a sport of teams. So how these teams actually interact with each other. Well, Stream-aligned teams could work with other stream-aligned teams in a very time and energy consuming way, which is called collaboration. Is collaboration good? Yes, no, yes, okay. Uh, can you collaborate with uh, five teams at the same time? Can you equally uh, good collaborate with 15 times at the, uh, teams at the same time? No because it's very time and energy cons consuming, right? Intense. Dunbar's number, right? We probably have hundreds of people on our WhatsApp, no WhatsApp list, uh, but well, we don't talk to all these people with the same uh, intensity or frequency, yeah? Um, we would rather see the collaboration as a very heavy type of, um, of, of, of collaboration, having defined goal, but also a time range. So, okay, we collaborate, we collaborate between two teams or maybe maximum three teams, but for how long? Okay, so we have these teams and they figure it out that they have a dependency. So, they unfortunately depend on some complicated subsystem. Uh, in a moment, we'll talk about the future of going out of this situation, but for now, we need to define that we have a relation like X as a service. They, are, they provide us a service. This service should have maybe an API. We're going to talk about it in a moment. It should be clear what we can get, how do we request something to, to get from this team. And this could be something technical, like, I don't know, know your customer or anti-money laundry services. I don't think you need to buy a bakery to get a bagel, unless you're Elon Musk. If you want to tweet, then you buy Twitter, right? But again, not many organizations can and or people can, <laughs> can basically make it happen. This could be the expertise, but it's what's, what is important for us as agile coaches or transformation agents. This could show what kind of skill or what kind of know-how we want to build in into stream-aligned teams so we get rid of this maybe unhealthy flow blocking uh, type of uh, interaction. Now, just briefly, of course, we could uh, put some platform into this picture. That's pre pretty obvious. Um, what is missing in this picture? What was the type of the team? Enabling, enabling, yeah, enabling team. So here they come. Here they come and uh, they facilitate. Not facilitate like run the meeting, but facilitate meaning like build or improve or strengthen the, the skill of, um, of a given uh, team or teams that they work with. Um, again, it should have a clear goal and clear time box 
because otherwise we will basically Okay, you don't see what I see, that's very good. Um, because otherwise, uh, this is creating another dependency. This is not what we want to do. So, <coughs> how, this, how these enabling teams could work? Well, we, if we identify that it's bad that we have dependency on the red complicated subsystem team, maybe we should find people who will build the enabling team and uh, this enabling team will start facilitating the change in the stream aligned teams. And after some time, we see the skill enough to get rid of this uh, dependency. Sometimes it happens naturally because some old system die off. Sometimes it's the matter of moving along the worldly map and commoditizing things which required expertise before. So if we want to get rid of it, yeah, just uh, just, just decide how to do it, but in the end, we may have this dependency to another complicated subsystem after some time. What is important that this approach, this diagnosis, shouldn't lead us to something that we curve in, stone, curve in stone and say, this is our organization, it will look like this months from now. Because that means that we don't rebuild the organization continuously to meet requirements or deliver value to our customers. What is funny, we think of us, our bodies, as like really stable. We still have, you know, 190 centimeters, what I had some years ago. But the fact is that cells in our bodies are basically changing every few weeks, right? Or even days, depending on the type of the cell. So we look the same, but these are not the same cells that you or I had when we see each other uh, last time. So what is important is like we should also look at this evolution of, of the mm, company. So maybe now we have this facilitation happening here, um, and now we have this facilitation happening here, and we got rid of this uh, dependency here, but our product now requires something new, and yeah, we have this type of interaction here. We don't say that we can completely get rid of it, because things change. Now, is it enough? Well, I want you to, to invite you to do one kind of exercise. What may be helpful is basically trying to agree, visualize, again, talking Kanbanish, this kind of team API. So this is something what I like because this is the language that dev our colleagues, developers, like very much. If you, if you tell them, let's hug the trees, uh, let's build the API, yeah. Okay, maybe that's also interesting uh, fact that this whole solution comes from solution architects. So we could give them the name, they usually have it. We could identify and agree what kind of team they are and what kind of team they should be. What is their way of work? Is it Scrum? Is it continuous work? What is it? What are the contact channels? Uh, what are their synchronization points? But first of all, what they built and what they run and how they interact now, and how they will interact in coming months, because that's probably to a certain degree pro predictable. Well, what about managing expectations? If I don't know that you're working intensively with other team on something uh, really important for us, because you are in this collaboration mode, if I file a request or ticket to you and I don't reply to you, you may think I don't like you or I'm mean or I'm lazy. But maybe we should clearly also visualize and map service level agreements or service level expectations or pool policies. It's not like I don't like you. It's not like we don't want to cooperate. It's just like this is not something that justifies that we drop everything that we do. Uh, to basically fulfill your request. What I did in this company is we, we, we made a kind of map. We just took a mirror board and on this mirror board we mapped some, some teams and their APIs. And it was interesting uh, fact that it was a great source of help for people who are new in the teams. Do you have high rotation in your teams? Yeah, okay, some hands up. How do your people learn where to go and, and how to ask? Sadly, I hear the answer, oh, you will work here for five months, you will know. Okay, that's dangerous. I also had interesting uh, comment to this. 
uh, one of the people from the company I, I, I mentioned said, yeah, but it means like we would need to rebuild it every three months. What's going to happen if you're not going to rebuild it and you're not going to build it in the first place? Uh, dangerous. So, summarizing, we are talking about evolution. We are not talking about codifying, justifying the way the things are now. Team topologies are, first of all, a kind of really bad name because this is about the whole organization made out of teams. Uh, so we are talking about the organizational design. We are talking about something that is applicable to the whole company. I know I focused mostly on IT or software products here, but this could be applied to educational sector, to marketing, to recruitment, whatever, because we are talking about the company where yeah, you have muscles, a lot of muscles, but you don't have liver and kidney and brain, <coughs> you're not going to run anywhere, even if your muscles are strongest. What is interesting for me, I won't hide it, it's like evolutionary approach. So no one says, oh, you do it all bad. Yeah, let's see where we are and let's take it further. It could improve the communication. It could, uh, first of all, not be blind to things that we have in our, um, in our reality. And uh, what is interesting in here is we want to balance two things. On one hand, it's absolutely obvious that we want to build our organization for fast flow. We expect fast flow from organizations as customers. But on the other hand, we don't want to say it that we disregard human nature and to do it by overburning, overloading, overwhelming people but by managing the cognitive load for the fast flow. It's always a kind of trade-off, I know, but again, I'm going to refer to what I heard from Craig. It's a sad reality of what's possible. Okay. It's an approach to basically identify your organization, build this kind of model, evolve it into your own organization. What I find by myself, uh, of course, compatible with evolutionary Kanban approach, and if it sounds interesting, I recommend try to do these three steps. Try to build a map, maybe with your colleagues, Scrum Masters or Agile Coaches. Try to discover the type of interactions that you have between the teams. If you see that these type of interactions are unclear, maybe try to yeah, build the team, team APIs. Um, if you're interested in more, uh, probably we'll have some questions now, but you can get the infographics. The infographics are like the very basics of uh, you know the right language to, to have it straight. They are now available in English, German, Japanese, and Polish. Um, probably reading the book reading the book won't hurt. Although remember, platform groupings, not platforms. Uh, I interviewed one of the co-authors in my podcast. So if you follow Kanban Przekawy in the episode 55, we have the uh, interview in English. Uh, and of course, you can ask me, I don't bite. Um, ahead of time. Very well, because we have some questions. Shoot. Okay, shoot, okay. Yeah. Uh, the first one, can you measure cognitive load somehow? <coughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I expected this question and I'll say it this way. Um, if we enter a room, we breathe in, and we know if it's smelly or not. We know if it's an ocean shore or if it's a locker room after the baseball match. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Empirical. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Second question. How to balance um, this flexible mm, structure of teams, team composition? Uh, with the team formation process, phases of team mm. development to achieve self-organization and high performance, team mm -hmm. needs to reach at least some mm -hmm. more okay. major state. Of um, I'm not going to like revert to the slide when I said stable teams are good. So just again to be clear, probably stability to a certain degree in the, to in the teams is absolutely helpful. Um, on the other hand, I don't think we are chasing the right rabbit. So I don't think we propose like rebuilding the teams continuously. On the other hand, if you look at the org chart, we see a stable structure. But if you look inside each of these boxes and measure, 
for how long the members are the team actually work there, you figure it out that because of the high rotation on the job market, you have only a fake uh, impression of having stable teams. So I don't know if this is really the biggest pain. Okay. So um, there is also a last question. Uh, um, yeah, two actual questions, but I su suggest that uh, you should reach that Radek directly, because the last one was, what was it about? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you can catch me in the dark alley after the conference and explain yeah. it to me. Okay. Thank you so much, Radek. Thank you.